Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Welcome, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Co-op. Uh, this is a great day in the neighborhood. And in D.C., it is sunny out. The skies are blue. we got some white clouds, and the grass and trees are really green. It's a great, great day to be alive. And today, we are talking with Sarah. Sarah is a lead coffee roaster and production supervisor at Equal Exchange. And Sarah, how do you say your last name? Is it Rizak? Rizak. Rizak. I'm okay. an H and a nest that sounds like a Z. Rizak. Okay, got it. So how long have you been with uh, Eco Exchange? Uh, almost eight years now, yeah. Started in uh, late 2012 as a coffee roaster and uh, have been the lead coffee roaster for about five years now. So, so five years you've been lead coffee roaster. Is this sort of like what you wanted to do when you were a kid? You said when they asked you, oh, I want to be a lead coffee roaster. Given that no one in my family really drinks coffee, no. I think probably when I was five years old, I wanted to be a plumber or a pastor. Uh, since both my parents were pastors, that's probably what I thought I would do. Oh, both of you. So I'm surprised. You didn't go into the pastorship. I did not. No. It seems it's a lot of work, a lot of emotional labor. So I took the easy yeah, way out. That, that's a calling. I got it because it is hard work. I got that. Uh, and so you got an easy job. You just roast coffee. I just roast coffee, supervise people doing it, smell delicious all the time. Yeah, it's a pretty great job. It's a good way to okay. connect the mind and the body. So how did you find out about Eco Exchange? And at five years old, did you want to be in a co-op? <laughs> I didn't think at 25 years old, I knew what a co-op was. But I was volunteering on a farm in central Massachusetts uh, called Heifer Farm, which is connected with Heifer International. And someone from Equal Exchange, Peter Buck, happens to be a longtime supporter of, of Heifer Farm in Rutland. And he came out and talked to the volunteers there about Equal Exchange and about co-ops and invited us to the roastery. And I'd wanted to be a coffee roaster for a couple of years. And so when I was leaving the farm, I, I found a job there, a job opening and applied for it and, uh, and got it somehow with no experience and learned how to roast coffee and then learned that some of the skills I had learned working in a university were applicable to the co-op um, and facilitating. And so that's how I got involved more with the co-op and uh, with governance there. Fantastic. So what is a coffee roaster? What do you do? <laughs> great, great question. So, Basically, roasting coffee is taking a, a green coffee bean. So uh, coffee is grown on coffee trees or bushes, and it's picked by hand when the cherries are ripe. Basically, coffee is, is a cherry. It's the pit of a cherry. And then the farmers will take the fruit off the outside, ferment it. There are different ways of doing that that change the flavor of coffee. And then by the time it gets to us, it's just the seeds from the inside the coffee bean that have been dried to about 8 to 12% moisture. We take those coffee seeds, basically, and put them inside of a roaster. That's a cast iron drum rotating over a, a flame. And basically, we use heat to evaporate moisture, to caramelize the sugars in the bean, and then control chemical reactions to bring out the different flavor notes that we attribute to coffee. So it's part being a chemist, <laughs> Part being an artist, part being a mechanic, um, but on a normal day, it was basically watching green stuff turn brown. So, so you got a flavor note. I'm thinking that's a musician, also notes from coffee. Okay. Yeah, 
you can okay. sort of smell them in the roaster as they're coming out. You might start with something that's uh, a little bit like clover or grass, and then as the reactions happen and the sugar is caramelized, you start to smell things that smell like caramel or baking bread. And then we get into like chocolate chip cookies or toffee or, or dark chocolate fudginess, depending on how long we keep the roast in the, the coffee drum, the drum that's spinning over the heat. And controlling that reaction is what creates the different roast levels or if you like a medium roast coffee that's bright and acidic or a darker roast coffee that's got a really thick body and dark chocolatey notes, um, that's the craft of, of how it goes. Wow. Okay. I just thought you ground some beans and made coffee. I got no idea of all of this. Yeah, it's so, pretty great. So your job, you started out roasting, so you're on the floor roasting, turning the coffee beans and all of that stuff, maybe adjusting the heat or whatever you do as a chemist. You've got okay. it. Okay. And then you went into supervising, mm-hmm. What? right? So you're now yeah. lead coffee roaster? That's right. Okay. I have four guys on my team right now, Edson, Marcelo, Mark, and Mike, who do a lot of hands-on roasting on any given day. And I have trained them to understand what to look for in the beans, to understand how to make adjustments to the machine to bring out the qualities we're looking for. It's been interesting as a supervisor. Part of it is just maintaining the, the vibe around the machines and t- maintaining morale, helping people with uh, being effective at their jobs, but also helping them be effective people, which is not what I expected when I took on the job. Um, I think I probably thought supervising was going to be like, show up to work on time. You didn't show up. You need to show up tomorrow on time. Or like, this is what we have to do today. Great, you're going to do it. And that's all it would be. But I think it's, it's been a lot about helping develop people and about understanding how people are different and what they need um, from me as a supervisor to do their jobs better. And especially during COVID, it's been a lot about managing and supporting people's emotional well-being in the face of a global pandemic, which is pretty scary for most people. And so that's been an interesting shift in the work for sure. Scary is, uh, yeah, that's scary. COVID has been extremely scary, but manage, you said you look at what people's needs are. Most of the companies I've worked for just don't seem like they care about somebody's need. They're just concerned about the things that you thought was, how much are you producing a day? And you got to produce more. You got to be here on time. You got to be here, be here on time and get more productivity. Yeah, that's it. This thing of need, I mean, you all do that? What people's needs are? We definitely try to. We try to balance out what we need to do as a company. So, you know, we still need to meet orders and meet demand also to care about people and to take care of people. Um, work is, is something that shouldn't be all encompassing and it, it shouldn't be something that destroys people. It should be something that is a, a part of a healthy life. And so there are definitely times where, you know, we need to make more coffee. We, we roast about 25,000 pounds of coffee a day in 220 pound batches to 440 pound batches. So we roast, about 80 batches of coffee a day. And that means a person is standing there going through, you know, 15 minute batches all day long. That sounds boring. That sounds boring, boring, boring. That sounds boring as I'll get out. Okay. I'm sorry. It, would, <laughs> it would be boring if it was, you didn't have to keep an eye on beans because you never know what's going to happen to them. So the temperature outside affects how the beans roast, the moisture content of the beans affects how they roast. So you have to keep an eye on them and, Sometimes you get lulled a little bit into you're like, okay, it's all just going the way it's supposed to be going. But then something could happen. Uh, the piece of equipment could break and you could have a massive fire on your hands. So you have to be vigilant. It's one of the most mentally, emotionally, and physically tiring jobs that I've had, but also one of the most rewarding um, because it really keeps you on your toes and it's different every day, even though you're doing the same thing over and over again. It's always a little bit different. Yeah, so being a roaster, we look for, you know, managing our team, we look for fatigue, making sure people are staying hydrated on a daily basis. It's gotten really hot 
in West Bridgewater recently. So saying, do you need extra breaks? Because you could always make a mistake if you aren't feeling well. If you're mentally not there, you could miss something. There could be a fire. We work with large machinery. If you make a mistake, you could forget not to put your hand in somewhere that's moving and you could hurt yourself or you could hurt someone else. So keeping people safe is, is in part being aware of how they're feeling mentally and emotionally and supporting them to say, I need to step back or I need to take a break or I need to do something that's less mentally involved so that I can do this safely as well. And that's wonderful because I worked at Ford Dearborn in their plant. Uh, this was back in 19, wow, 60 something, 66. Wow. That was not on the, on that production floor, this caring about me. It was caring about how many, how many cars got out and how, how good a job that we did. That was it. Yeah, I didn't see any of this caring about people. So yeah, I like this a lot. So, so one of your roles is being a supervisor leader on the floor, and you also have been elected to the board of directors of Equal Exchange. That's right. So, what's that like? Uh, it has been very interesting. So, I was elected by other worker owners in the company to serve on our board, and our board has currently nine members. We actually just went through. Um, rewriting our articles of organization and bylaws to change up our board structure a little bit to incorporate consumers. We call them citizen consumers, which has been a really exciting and cool thing to work on. And so I was elected to take care of our business, to go through our financials and to help make tough decisions and to ask questions and to be a sounding board. I'm certainly not a financial expert by any means, but I try to use my critical thinking and ask good questions. I think that's why I was elected to fill that sort of space for sure. So we're going to take our first break, Sarah, and we'll come back. I like this talking about taking care of the business and being on the board and getting elected. So I really want to get into this governance of a cooperative and elected by other worker members and see what that's all about and how people, how people participate in the governance because so much different from the capitalistic model. But we'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. Uh, we have on the line with us today... Sarah, you got to say your last name for me again, Sarah. I'm going to get it in a little bit. I keep wanting to say the H. Uh, from Equal Exchange. Sarah Rizak. Yep. I always tell Rizak. people I have two silent H's in my name. Rizak. Okay. The sack. Rizak. Okay. When we left for the break, we were talking about you being on the board. So let me talk first before we go back to you. I want to talk a little bit about what does this co-op kind of look like? So a co-op is any business you can think of. And there's cooperative values and principles. So the cooperative values and principles are the main values I like, Sarah, are the ones that talk about the ethical values of honesty, openness, uh, social responsibility, and caring for one another, which is like a golden rule, if you will. Then there's the values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. So co-ops are volunteer and open membership, first principle, democratic member control, and this is the election you were talking about where you, each member gets one vote, one member, one vote. Member economic participation, which I want to get into, you pay to get in, and then if there's a profit, you get money back out. Autonomy and independence, it has to be autonomous and they have to make the decision, have to have control and make the decision. And the first reason I liked co-ops, uh, Sarah, was this fifth principle of education, training and information. I taught uh, 11 years of my life and I really like uh, this, this training, information, education. And the sixth principle, cooperation among co-ops and the seventh one is concern for community. 
So this Democratic member control, volunteer and open membership. So you were talking about you were elected by the other member owners. So what is that like in equal exchange? What's that all about? So every year on May 1st, typically, International Workers Day, we have our annual meeting of our membership. So this, this year it was all done by Zoom, which was a really different way of handling our democracy. And it's cool to see that it's still functional when we're not all in the same place. So leading up to that meeting, we have a nine-member board right now. Uh, we just authorized to have that go up to 11 board directors. And typically every year we elect a third of the board for three-year terms. Historically, we've had six directors who are members of the organization. So anyone who's a member can run to be on our board of directors. Ideally, so these members... Who- I'm sorry, these members are the workers there, right? That That's when you say that's the right. members. Yep. Okay, and the, so six of these members were elected to the board, six of the workers. Yep. Okay, okay. Yeah, and our our organization is pretty spread out. So we have our, our primary roasting and production facility and distribution facility is in West Bridgewater, Massachusetts, about an hour south of Boston. And then we also have a pretty large contingent in Portland, Oregon, um, a smaller warehouse distribution center in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then we have a couple other DSD or direct door delivery hubs in Cleveland, Madison, and Greenfield, Massachusetts. So our worker owners are spread out across the country, um, come from a lot of different places, a lot of different backgrounds. But in equal exchange, regardless of your, your job, what you do in the company, you are eligible to run for the board. And so uh, last year, I decided to put myself forward. Um, I was nominated by one of my, my fellow worker owners. My boss actually nominated me for the board. Um, and I went through a vetting process where other worker owners were able to ask me questions to ask me questions about what I might do on the board, what I thought about topics that were confronting the co-op, and uh, vetted me, and then ultimately at our annual meeting, elected me and another worker owner to serve three-year terms. Um, And that happens typically, that happens every year. We recently made a change to our governance to incorporate democratic process for our consumers as well. So we've had for several years now something called the Action Forum or our citizen consumers. And this is a a semi-autonomous group that we've created to help involve our consumers more actively in our business and in our democracy. And this spring, we actually voted as members and as our board to allow them to elect or select or nominate three candidates from within their group, the citizen consumer group, to serve on our board. And those candidates were then ratified or approved by the worker owner membership as well. Um, And that's the nine people that make up our board currently. So I could be on a board since I'm a consumer, since I buy your products and drink your teas and drink your coffee. And yeah, there are, there are a couple of additional requirements to be a part of our citizen consumer network or, or organizing efforts, but the, the bar is, pretty minimal and we do want to have people involved in growing the cooperative movement but also sharing in our democracy um, and sharing in the ways that equal exchange is trying to create alternative models of trade Um, so yes we would very happily welcome you to the civic and consumer network and to run for our board okay alternative models of trade okay so you you work there now uh, I guess it's now six and a half years ago, almost seven. We had Eco Exchange on for the month of December. That was the first year we were on air. And Rodney North was one of the people, of the four people that was on. And he told me something. I want to see if this works for you, too. He said, or hinders you, whatever the case may be, that in the in the daytime in his job, and I think he was in sales, I'm not don't remember exactly, but in the daytime, this chief operating officer was his boss, 
and he would be taking direction for him. At a night meeting, I don't know, once a month or however often the board meets, as board chair, his boss was taking direction from him and the other board members. And that's sort of learning each other's roles and being able to play those and do it harmoniously. For me, it would be challenging. Do you see anything like that in your roles, in your work? Yeah, actually, it's funny. Our organization has also started going through some succession planning. And so my boss's boss was recently appointed one of our vice presidents. So at our most recent meeting, he was one of the members of management sitting at the table who I was asking questions to about, you know, our sales numbers, what are we going to do? What's the plan for rebudgeting? And it certainly is a, a role reversal that can be challenging for a lot of people. I think it can be very intimidating for some people to go to work on a, you know, in an entry level job or, you know, doing sales or processing finance payments or whatever the case may be. And then, flip the switch and be asking the bigger questions about what is our organization going to do? And, you know, asking the president of the company, Rink, who is one of the founders, how are we going to, you know, stay alive? And COVID, when sales are are flat or are very challenging and a lot of our partners are having a hard time, I think that can be challenging for a lot of people. I've been really, really lucky as a, a coffee roaster, we're sort of on the outside of the sales team or on the, the, the office dynamics or anything. So I get to be really effective in my role out on the floor. And then it's not as much of a switch to just come into the, the boardroom and, and say like, hey, I know I'm doing everything that I can out there. I have questions for you about what we're doing in here. And there's a lot of respect and mutual respect between me and the, the leadership of the company that I think has, has helped a lot to being able to ask tough questions in a way that is non-confrontational, but also can be pointed at times. But it is one of the, the harder dynamics of being in a co-op to have your boss tell you something one day and then flip the switch and go around and say, great, today I get to ask you a question about the the bigger motivations for why you're telling us to do that. <laughs> So that boss has to have this mentality also, have to be bought into this mentality. You can't have a John Wayne type at the head. Ah, it's me, and we're going to do it my way. Okay. It's got to be this mutuality. Yeah? Yeah. There's certainly, I think it requires a, a certain amount of humility to your leadership to be willing to take questions from people who work from you. And I think that there has to be an openness and a willingness to be wrong. I think as supervisors, that's something that I've learned is that the more that I'm open to being wrong, the better I am at my job because I learn from other people. And I think that's one of the great things about co-ops is that the more that you can let more people with perspectives and different backgrounds and experiences be engaged in the work of running a business, the more creative you can be and have opportunities come up because you're listening to different voices. That's something that's really cool about anyone being able to run for the board. So we have to take our second break, and we're going to come back and talk about those different backgrounds and experiences, how you marry them all together, in particular, how do you get through this COVID-19. We'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. We're talking about worker, a worker co-op is equal exchange, have about 150 employees, 130 of them own the business, they're member owners. So just quickly, you know, this program is being sponsored by the National Cooperative Bank. They've been a partner, not just a supporter. They've given us a lot of ideas on how to improve our product here on this show and who could be on it. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So working in low-income communities has been what they've been about since the early 80s, and they just do an excellent job. Chuck Snyder and the group at NCB are 
just great people. Roberta McDonald said, um, Sarah, Roberta McDonald was with Cabot Creamery. Mm-hmm. She said that Chuck Snyder and the folks at NCB are angels with the work that they do. I'm getting the impression that the folks at Equal Exchange are angels also, particularly when you say you, you look at for different uh, backgrounds and experiences, how you can merge those, listen to those, how to be uh, humble and look for where you're wrong so that you can all, with all of these different voices, you can improve your processes, improve your product. And you're trying to figure out what you can do to stay alive during uh, COVID-19. How can you provide your product, provide your service with these, with this COVID-19? So what are you doing to stay alive in, in this, in this environment? It's a great question. So I think when COVID-19 hit, like a lot of food businesses, we saw a huge spike. So early March and April, when people were panic buying everything off of the store shelves, we saw that. Um, we saw huge spikes in our sales, um, huge spikes in what we needed to ship, what we needed to roast. And very, very quickly, it became clear that we had to come up with a philosophy and our senior level management decided that the key components that would guide us through COVID were protect our business and protect our people. I think I probably put those in the wrong order. So protect our people and protect our business. So our office staff, anyone who was able to work from home, went home. And the only people left in our facilities, so primarily I work in West Bridgewater, which is our roastery and our primary distribution center. So my experience is mostly from there. We sent non-essential people home, and so we had our roasting team and our packaging team and our distribution teams in the building. So we went from probably having, you know, 50 to 75 people in a building in a day to 25 or 30, um, which is a big shift. And our team in roasting production, we moved really quickly to limit the number of people who are interacting in a day. So in the early parts of COVID, we went to seven days a week with half of our team on for four days and then off for four days, which enabled us to stay caught up with a lot of the orders that were coming in and then realized that that was leaving us a little bit shorthanded. And so we modified as COVID went on to bring more people in, strengthen the cleaning procedures, started wearing masks every day. And around the same time, the company as a whole received the PPP loan and we introduced an additional uh, program for employees that went above and beyond the, the federal programs for paid family leave for COVID and added four weeks of additional paid time off um, for our employees. And that was a really important move. An, an addition of what now? What an additional, additional four weeks of paid time off. So Equal four Exchange weeks. already has, yeah. That's a, an additional month. So are, how much do you get off regularly? So Equal Exchange offers uh, nine paid sick days a year, two personal days, um, and then anywhere from 10 to 25 vacation days. We have a very generous paid time off um, policy in addition to holidays and health care. But for COVID-19, we really wanted to make sure that people weren't worried about coming to work or protecting their health, protecting their families taking care of people um, and their families who might have been sick or coming to work if they thought they might be sick. Um, I know in a lot of companies, the, the concerns that employees have had have been, if I don't show up to work, I'm going to lose my job. And that has, has led to the spread of COVID-19 in a lot of places. And so for us, it was a priority to make sure that people knew that if they didn't feel well, they could stay home. And it wasn't going to adversely affect their employment. Or if they had kids and they couldn't find child care because all of the child care centers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island were shut down, they could stay home with their children at full pay as opposed to the paid family leave that's only 67%. Um, so very early on, the goal was to make sure that if you felt sick, you didn't come to work. If you were at work, you were being screened to make sure you were healthy. Um, and in some departments, there were uh, reduced hours. We tried to be as flexible with people as possible to help with, you know, there's been a lot of anxiety that people have been experiencing. Um, for my team, I mentioned earlier, if you're 
not focused while you're roasting, you can make a mistake that could be as as minimal as, you know, a bad batch of coffee or as much as somebody gets hurt. And so you want to make sure people were able to take care of themselves physically as well as mentally and emotionally and be there for their families. Wow. So what I just gathered from what you're talking about, you got nine paid sick leave, two personal days. So that's 11 days. I just said, okay, that's two weeks okay, mm -hmm. off. Then you have from 10 to 25 days off for vacation. Mm -hmm. I guess if you start, you get two weeks off vacation. Yep. And then as you're there longer, you can get up to five weeks that's vacation. Right. Mm -hmm. So here you go, automatically you got between four weeks, two weeks for sick and personal days, and two weeks for vacation, that's a month, to seven weeks, almost a, a month and a, quarter, a third. And then you add another four weeks on it that people can, can take if they need it. Right. For this, for this, during this COVID. So that says to me, you've got between eight weeks and 11 weeks off that somebody could take right. uh, that that's between two and three months or two, two months and two and two months and a third, three third, three quarters. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot. How you all make it? Wow. Okay. So that's very generous. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's a little bit, uh, I think in retrospect, I think, you know, being able to get the PPP loan when I, when I think about it, I sort of think basically two months of, salaries were covered. And so um, I think about it as sort of like, and I, I'm not in the group that made this decision. So this is how I think about it on the level of being a sort of ground level manager, one of the troops. I think of it as sort of like we got two months of free salary and we gave one month to employees and use the other month to support the business and support paying those salaries. But in retrospect, it's a, it's a really big move for sure and i think for my team it's been helpful for people for child care in particular um you can't bring your kid to work or you know try to work from home which i know is for most people impossible to work from home and do child care at the same time so a lot of people have been using these hours to help take care of their kids and for our team it's been for mental health reasons you know dealing with the anxiety We've also had a couple of positive cases in our facility. So some people have taken it to, you know, recover from being sick. Some people have taken it to self-isolate in case they, they might be sick. Some of people have just taken it as mental health time to just clear their heads and get a little bit of space. But I think it's been really valuable um, to have the time available and not have to worry about that. Wow. This is exciting. I, I just read an article last night of how black kids are getting hit hard with this COVID-19. And it talks about a lady by the name of McGowan, Courtney McGowan. Uh, she got furloughed in March and uh, a lot of mental distress in her family. She and her, her significant other broke up. She's in California. When she went back to get ready to go back to work. She, her child care wasn't there. The, the, the child care facility hadn't opened. And she asked, can I have your son in the office for eight hours? Well, he, she couldn't. So she asked for more time off. That's right. Mm -hmm. A flexible schedule is what she asked. And the boss said, no. And he fired and he hired somebody else. Now I don't know what company it is, but it's that I almost cried when I read that story last night. So this thing of giving another four weeks, another 160 hours so she could take care of her eight-year-old, deal with her mental issues of everything that somebody's going through. Now, she's a single mom without a job. That an unemployment rate goes up. Okay, yeah. all of the bad ills of, of, of our society. Uh, so right here, as a co-op, uh, you are putting things in place to help yourself, help the employees. Wow. <laughs> yeah, a worker-owned co-op puts policies in place that helps the workers. <laughs> okay. One of my coworkers, Hillary Johnson, who is on the board of the U.S. Federation and was on our board for, for many years, one told well, me. Just, I'm sorry. 
it's the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops you're talking about. Correct. Yes, okay, the, the major umbrella worker cooperative in the U.S. Okay, so she's yeah. on that board. Go, I'm sorry, she's go on ahead. that board. She was on our board for, for six years and told me once that co-ops are there to serve the needs of their members. The, the purpose of a co-op is to serve its members, which is something that I, you know, I grew up in, in a very a service-oriented family where my parents taught me that if I had something to offer – then I was obligated to offer it to be of service. So I oftentimes think about being of service to the co-op, but in times like this in particular, it is important to keep in mind that the co-op is there because of its members and for its members. And when the co-op succeeds or our business succeeds, we benefit from that. So if, if Equal Exchange was not in a, a financial position to offer more paid time off, we would have to go back and figure out how to, to stay in business, how to stay there for our members. And we are in the process of rebudgeting right now. And I don't think that offering more paid time off has negatively affected us. It's the right thing to do in the right minute. And now we think about moving forward, what other kinds of adjustments do we need to make to continue to be successful? And it might mean that as we're, we're reevaluating what things will look like for the rest of this year, you know, maybe we're not going to be as profitable at the end of the year. That's possible. But we made a decision that helped our members right now and helped us to stay in business, helped us keep our employees fed and paid and take care of their families, which is really important. And so now we think longer term, what do we do to continue to do that for our members? Okay, so I want to tell you real quickly before we take our next break, everybody out there, there's four basic types of co-ops. So it all depends on who owns and controls the business. If the co-op is owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative, and that's what Equal Exchange is. So any business could be owned and controlled by the employees. And what Sarah just told us, the reason for having a worker co-op, the reason is to what can you do to take care of your members, members, the employees. If it's only controlled by the consumer, then uh, that's the people that buy the products or services. It's called a consumer cooperative. And food co-ops a lot of time are consumer co-ops, or they could be worker co-ops. Consumer co-ops are credit unions, housing co-ops. Uh, there's a lot of different consumer co-ops. Uh, then if it's owned and controlled, well, the farmers started, uh, creating co-ops to purchase what they need, and it's called a purchasing co-op. And they also started marketing co-ops to create a company that markets their product, the marketing co-ops. Those are four basic types, and uh, we, we're going to take our next break. And I really want to come back and spend more time talking about what the co-op is doing to help get through COVID, and you've already mentioned that with these extra 160 hours. We'll be right back, everybody. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Sarah Rizak is our guest. I spelt it phonetically, Sarah, and I said, Rizak, I got it. Thank you. So we be, we were talking about you were raised, your, both your parents are ministers, and they taught you of being of service. And you have found your place in co-ops because the co-op is there to be of service for its members. And that's the workers in a worker cooperative. That's the reason it's for being. In a, co, in a capitalistic model, there's three reasons for being. One is profit number two is profit and number three is profit okay uh and in my mba program i learned that you make all decisions on what is the greatest return on investment for the shareholder mm -hmm. we're in a co-op the three concerns are people particularly right now is employees the people then the planet and then profit profit is important mm -hmm. but it's not the main and only important factor in co-ops. And so you've learned how to be of service. So you also mentioned before the break that you all added 160 hours of benefit for people to work on their mental, physical, emotional health through, through this process. And that's additional to the normal 
vacation time and sick leave and personal leave. So a person could be off as little, at the minimum is two months and the max is almost three months, two months and three weeks. So what else has Equal Exchange done to get through COVID-19? I think people is obviously important. I think our partnership with food co-ops, which have been longstanding partnerships, one of the first places that Equal Exchange sold products was food co-ops. And I know that our sales team has done a tremendous amount of work to support food co-ops in making decisions about how to stay open through COVID in a safe way. You know, we have resources to develop protocols and can talk about what's been working for us, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, sanitizing, all of those kinds of things. And having long-term partnerships with, with bigger companies certainly has helped us through coronavirus and will probably sustain us as we go along. But I think the commitment of, of employees to continue to show up to work and being engaged in the, the co-op is what will ultimately get us through because we as members own shares in the business. We also have capital available to us. So um, a lot of businesses right now don't have you know, money in the bank or capital that they can tap into. But as a worker-owned co-op, part of our benefit as owners is that we share in the process at the end of the year. Um, and so members here build equity in the business. Wait, 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 wait. I just want you to say that again. You build equity. You, you share the profits. That's right. So, you know, you said the three things, people, environment, and profit. We are a for-profit company. And so we're not driven by profit, but we do make money. And when we do at the end of the year, some portion of that is paid out to the member owners, the worker owners in the company. So if I'm going to work and I'm, you know, working my 40 hours a week or 45 or overtime or whatever else, at the end of the year, I can hope that we're going to be profitable and that I will take home a check. That's a portion of those profits. But half of that amount that we're paid every year also goes back into the business. It's called retained earnings. And in equal exchange, those that 50% of the, the profit share that I'm entitled to gets reinvested in the business in the form of class B shares. Um, and so equal exchange, the, the members and the, the workers have a voting share, but they also own non-voting shares that pay dividends as well. So we own a very significant chunk of our company and have invested sweat equity, but also have actual financial equity in the business. So you can build wealth, financial wealth. Right. You also have a say-so on the business. You can, you can, as members in your member meeting in May, I think you said, you all will can create policies, but also you can be elected to the board mm -hmm. and you have a direct say on how this works. So you create social wealth. And if Equal Exchange makes money, then who decides where that money goes and how much is divided or whatever that, who makes that so, decision? Yep. So we, the board ultimately decides, you know, how much is going to be paid out, but there's a formula written to, into our bylaws about how much of our earnings gets paid into profit sharing. So it's literally a part of, of the fundamental documents of our business is that I believe it's 40% of our profit that is then calculated um, is reduced somewhat by the number of hours worked by members. So we only get paid based on the percentage of labor that is done by member owners. So if we as an organization have 150 employees, but only 130 of them actually own shares in the company, we get paid based on the percentage of work done by the people who actually own shares. The goal is not to profit off of the labor of other people. It's to profit off of your own patronage, your labor patronage. But it's, and based, that's on part hours, of it's, it's based on hours worked, not on how much money you make. That's right. So, yeah. if, the, so if the head guy that makes the most money works 40 hours a week and the person that's the least paid, I don't know who that might be, it might be the janitor, but whoever is the least paid would get the same dividend if they work 40 hours a week. 
It's wow. yes, okay. you get paid the same percentage of profit. So everyone who is a full member who's paid off their share, they get the same check at the end of the year, regardless of salary or regardless of, Position, of anything salary, else. Minute. Position. Yep. And so forty percent. So where does that other sixty go? Uh, of uh, so the other sixty percent of profits are are kept by the the business for you know doing the business of the business. Forty um, percent and. I'm pretty sure that I'm saying it's 40%. I recently okay, read sorry. the bylaws, right. but the numbers are not the, <laughs> the numbers are not right. that, but it is in okay. our bylaws what what they are and then the calculation our finance team goes through that. There's all of the tax stuff because patronage is tax deductible. It's another good reason for people to become co-ops. If you pay out your profits to your members, you don't pay the government on that. And so then part of that money is reinvested in the business, which is, you know, for me, I've been here for eight years almost and an, and an owner for seven. And the amount that I have invested back in Class B shares is probably around $9,000 in seven years, which is wow, pretty remarkable. And I started, you know, I started at Equal at thirteen fifty nine an hour. Thirteen dollars and fifty nine cents. <laughs> yeah, back in <laughs> back in twenty twenty twelve, and that was the best paying job I had had. So, so yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I wouldn't have expected to have had profit sharing be that significant over the course of my time there. So here's what I've got: is that there's a formula created that's in your bylaws and your structures. The members must approve those bylaws and structures. And so they are, the members are deciding how much of their profit goes to the membership and how much it go, stays in the business. <laughs> I know some co-ops will have it broken into three ways. So much goes to the members, so much stays in the business, and so much goes out in the community to, <laughs> to, to satisfy that seven principle of, of concern for the community. So, you, as an individual, started at one of the least paying jobs at Equal Exchange? Probably, 13, yeah. Very entry level. Yeah. Entry level job. And now you both moved up to supervisory position. And through the years, you've been given a patronage check. That was the part of the third principle of member economic participation. You had to pay to get in. You have to wait a year before you can get in, and then you can pay over time, at least by the second year. Whenever you get that paid off, then you start getting the in the pot, in the pool, to receive mm -hmm. these profits back. So you've paid to get in. You've gotten a check at the end of the year, and you have saved money in this Class B stock that also makes money. Mm -hmm. And you've got $9,000, where 47% of Americans won't have $400 let alone 9000 they won't right. have $400 saved up for an emergency. So you're better off than 50% of Americans. I just rounded up to 50%. And that's anybody that works in Eco Exchange. So, yeah. so COVID-19, you're doing a lot. A lot you're doing just because of the principles of co-ops of being there for the employees. So you're doing things for the health of the employee, mental health, physical health, emotional health. Uh, child care, whatever it might be. And you have a very liberal fringe benefits package. Uh, health insurance? Yep. We have full health insurance for full-time employees. Yep. Yeah, wow. I don't. I literally don't pay anything for my health insurance. Okay. So what we haven't been able to get to because we only have two minutes, so I need to get you back or somebody else <laughs> back. Because we really wanted to talk about, we talked about what you're doing Eco exchange to get through it, but I wanted to spend time talking to you about what's the next steps. What is, what could eco exchange do to get us on the other end to mm -hmm. create a new norm and also what you can do to sort of eradicate if we can, or limit the racism in America. And I just think by being a co-op, that's, that's kind of like automatic, but, in the last minute you have, you want to address either of those two topics? Yeah, I think co-ops are fundamental to that because you can build equity. You can bring people together. And I think that economic justice is racial justice, is environmental justice, which is 
what we've been doing at Equal Exchange for years, and we just have to do it harder, make it messier, and do it better. Thank you, Sarah, so very much. Economic justice is... Uh, it helps with the environment and racial. Thank you. Everybody out there, please have a great week, and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.